door talk, Healthy Hackers. Um, uh, I, we will begin with who we are. Um, this is Carolyn Rupar, uh, my wife, and she is, well. Well, I'm a chef. I am a foods and nutrition sciences student. Um, and I work at the University of Western Ontario in the exercise and pregnancy lab. Yep. And um, I'm a Ruby programmer and linguist by degree. Um, I've been, you know, working on Ruby stuff for, I guess, four or five years. And I work for a company called Video Juicer, which is based out of the UK. Um, and uh, one of the other important things, since my wife has never been to a Ruby conference before, um, who are you? Um, you guys are all, uh, I presume, Ruby, uh, Rubyists, programmers, uh, hackers. Um, and the uh, thing that I enjoy about um, coming to Ruby conferences and talking with Rubyists is that Rubyists tend to be a passionate and interdisciplinary lot, so people like me, a linguist, um, fit in pretty well. Um, and there's always interesting people coming in from different parts of the community and, you know, talking about new and different things. And one of the, uh, so you, you can pick up new threads that uh, uh, come into the Ruby community, and one of the things that I've noticed this year, at least, is that um, there's a, a new focus on health and um, uh, exercise, and uh, that's exemplified by the fact that we've got um, uh, runs that are associated with um, uh, most of the major Ruby conferences. So uh, I know that Chad got dragged into um, a run uh, at Ruby Kaigi um, this year, which was a lot of fun, and um, uh, eRubyCon also had a, a run. So uh, you know, it's great to see um, people in our industry who are interested and. In, uh, uh, engaged in not just like code and things like that, but also uh, looking at uh, their health and um, other s stuff around what it is that we do. Um, and uh, another thing that I like about that is the fact that you know there's this sort of shared ethos around what it is that we do. And you know, software engineering is science. Um, that's a little bit darker than I thought it would be. Yeah, it doesn't um, show up very well. <laughs> Apologies. Um, That's big book of science. Yes, big book of science. <laughs> but uh, uh, software engineering and what we do on a daily basis is not just science. Um, what we're really looking to do is uh, to try and um, uh, help people solve their problems, right? We, we are using the, the skills that we have to identify um, and help uh, analyze solutions for what, what people are, uh, need in order to get other stuff done. Um, and you know, in the, the business world, and, you know, a lot of the way that people make money using Ruby is consultancy. Um, and you know, w w the, the core ethos here is we've got a set of skills and knowledge about getting things done. And we're, we're going to try and apply them to the domains that um, people uh, need, need solutions for. So I mean, uh, as a result, you, you see a lot of talks at Ruby conferences that are about craftsmanship or methodology. And we really uh, talk about what the process is by which we go about learning things and helping people solve um, their issues. Uh, especially um, when you, you talk about craftsmanship and methodology, people are interested in being able to do things like um, build software efficiently and in a transparent manner and interact with um, the, the people who need help. Um, and uh, you know, so, so people are familiar with uh, process graphs like this. Um, which is you know, uh, an agile planning uh, cycle that uh, people are sort of used to. But um, the most important part about um, a graph like this is the fact that this is uh, based on the same sort of scientific principles that are used in a lot of other fields. Um, this is uh, about the whole uh, planning, analysis, uh, implementation, testing cycle that uh, we're supposed to do as agile programmers. Um, but the uh, critical thing to understand about this is that this is sort of fundamental to a lot of fields. And so this is exactly the sort of uh, thing that uh, dietitians do when they're uh, consulting with um, their patients. Which plan of care is our medical lingo. It doesn't have to do anything with medicine necessarily or with illness or with anything of that sort. Yeah. We and just like pretending that we're in science like medicine parts. Yeah, and one of the interesting things about dietetics is the fact that um, it, it is an interdisciplinary field just the same way that what, what we're doing is interdisciplinary. We don't fit in anywhere. <laughs> um, and uh, in that vein, um, it's, it's important to remember that, you know, uh, even though consultancy is, and craftsmanship is one of those things that we focus on when helping other people, not all software is written by uh, consultants for clients. Sometimes, you know, we're uh, writing stuff for ourselves or for, you know, just for the heck of it. And likewise, not all nutritional plans are developed by dietitians. In fact, the vast majority of people who make decisions about what they're eating or their, their health choices probably have never heard of what a dietitian is. 
Um, so, uh, you know, it's, um, but the, the same sort of um, methodological things can still apply, and we should really think about uh, some of these things while we're hacking up code for our own needs, or uh, whether uh, you're um, hacking up your diet plan, whether it's intentional or not. I mean, you make choices every day. Everybody has to eat. I think for the most part, everybody wants to eat, too. Well, yes, that's true. Um, <laughs> being on a tube feed, not fun. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Uh, so y you can see this hacker ethos pervades, you know, um, a lot of different other fields, and, and you'll, you'll see this with uh, things like molecular gastronomy. Um, it, it certainly has entered into the food, um, the, the food world and nutritional world, where um, you uh, have a lot of interest. There, there are movements that have formed around um, trying to uh, identifying a problem and trying to optimize towards a solution. Um, so you've got things like the whole food movement, which says, okay, we're trying to uh, deal with minimally processed food, um, and you know, which will be healthier for you, or the raw food movement. Or even fruititarians. Fruititarians think they should only consume fruit, uh, nothing else. Uh, and they're part of the raw food movement, so the fruit has to be raw always. Yeah, and um. yeah, so, so food that has been cooked is bad, <laughs> which is sort of interesting. And then you've got, what, the slow food movement? The slow food movement, which is basically the anti-fast food movement, which kind of makes sense. Um, and the slow food movement is basically a moving movement back toward the social part of eating. Uh, so sitting down with your family and eating, as opposed to eating at your desk, guilty. Um, <laughs> yeah, guilty as well. Eating in front of the TV, you know, eating in front of your computer, doing whatever. Yeah. <coughs> And then there's locavores who, I mean, there's the 100-mile diet, but it doesn't have to just be like the 100-mile diet. It's people who are trying to always consume things that are as close as possible to where they're from. Um, molecular gastronomy, which is basically, um, I don't know if, as a kid, we always had the demonstration of making ice cream with using liquid nitrogen. It's basically that, except for a whole lot more. Right. So it's using science principles uh, from usually chemistry or physics and using it in a, a food manner. Yeah, so silly, silly food tricks, basically, with science. Yay, science. Um, <laughs> They're fun. Yeah, and so, you know, a lot of different people are trying to solve uh, problems, but uh, the, the question comes up, um, how do we tell whether they're doing it right or not? Um, uh, or more importantly, if you're not a, a slow foodie or raw foodie, how do you tell whether you're, what you're doing is right? Um, and, you know, we've got, again, these skills that we've developed to figure out whether uh, what we're doing is correct in, you know, the software domain. And, again, it relies on tools that we can use to uh, apply in other domains, particularly when we're talking about uh, systematically trying to make our health better. So uh, if you look at some of these movements, um, uh, there are, uh, each, each one has its own goal. Some of them are, um, more style, so molecular gastronomy, for instance, is uh, applying science tricks to food, but the other ones have very explicit objectives, and you can ask things like, um, what measures are they using? Um, and uh, so, for instance, with locavores, um, uh, hundred you, mile diet. Yeah, you're you're trying to eat as close as possible to reduce your carbon footprint or whatever you. Um, uh, measure you, you want to use, but um, it, it's sort of an, uh, this is another thing that, you know, if you were at the GIS talk, I asked um, uh, whether, uh, whether you could define your own distance function for um, two points on a map. Um, if you're just looking at a map and saying, oh, well, my food came from Ontario, which is where we usually are, um, you, you can still say, okay, so uh, is, is food, uh, Ontario is a very large province, for instance, so where in Ontario did it come from, et cetera, et cetera. But you know, some of these measures are misleading. Um, for instance, with uh, BC salmon, if you want to explain that. Uh, British Columbia, um, Canada again, sorry. I'm from Canada. Um, basically, frequently, BC salmon, if you're in Vancouver and BC, you can go to a store and you can go buy it. However, the actual salmon, who was caught by some fishermen in BC, was then shipped to China to be deboned, um, which is questionable, but apparently it's cheaper to ship fish to China for them to debone it as opposed to us. And then it's shipped back here um, to BC and then sold as being local. Well, that salmon's probably 
a lot more traveled than most North Americans in general, because like how many of us go back and forth between China and here constantly? But that food has definitely gone there and back. And at some point, it's also been gone through some kind of universal grading system to make sure that it's edible and what people want. Um, so who knows where that happened? Uh, in Ontario, all food goes through Toronto. It doesn't matter where it was growing and so on, uh, which I guess it would have been useful to have a slight map, but <laughs> at any rate, most of your food is much more well-traveled than what you are. Yeah, so like a piece of salmon would, uh, just judging by the miles I got flying to Ruby Kaigi and back, would have qualified for a uh, silver membership and any of the Star Alliance uh, airlines uh, from taking that trip. And you know, people think that they're eating, eating locally, um, but it's, I unless you actually know what the chain of custody is in essence, they really could have been anywhere and back. And um, so, you know, you really have to ask, like, what are the assumptions that uh, you're making when uh, you're, you're uh, using these measures? Um, and so, like, a straight line distance isn't a great one. Or, like, the, the uh, raw foodies, for instance, they, they assume that, you know, you shouldn't cook anything. What's the justification behind that? Is there data to support that? And really, there isn't. Uh, for, like, tomatoes, for example, lycopene, which is an antioxidant, uh, is only really bio available, so like you can only really use it after tomatoes have been cooked. So it doesn't matter how many tomatoes you eat, you would never get the lycopene uh, if you eat them raw. Right, and and this is one of those things where you know you, you kind of have to be interdisciplinary to know um, whether what you're optimizing towards is actually something that is going is going to meet the goals your stated goals. So. Um, uh, Slow food or whole foods, on the other hand, um, are actually uh, you know reasonable in terms of what they're trying to achieve. Like slow food, um, you know, their their goal is you know to try and promote the uh, the the social aspect of food. And well, I mean, if you're asking everybody to sit down around a table, then that is uh, probably going to achieve your goals. But um, it, it may not necessarily fit with everybody's lifestyle, depending on what it is that you do. How much free time like. does everybody have? Right. Which is, you know, if you're asking somebody who's in the programming community, you get varying answers. So, also like with something like whole food, um, there's an assumption that it should not be processed at all. So if we go for, I don't know, frozen peas, frozen corn, all of those things are picked and processed during their, ult like, when they're the most nutritious, right coming off the field. Um, so if you get corn or peas that have been shipped from Mexico or wherever, that have been uh, ripened chemically on their transportation here, then it's actually better for you to eat the frozen stuff because there's been less degradation towards the nutrients. Um, so is all processed foods? It depends how you define processed, whether they're better for you or worse. Yeah, so I mean, basically, you know, picking your, your diet is kind of like picking your, your software tools. I mean, you, you really need to, you know, um, understand what assumptions are being made, um, you know, the, the, the libraries that you choose can have a profound impact on what your life is going to be if you've committed to a project and um, just the same way your, your diet can. And, you know, you're, you're going to have to deal with the unintended consequences um, of the, your, your library choices if you haven't understood it um, well. Um, on top of that, you know, um, you need to know where your tools are appropriate. So if you suddenly, um, uh, all right, the majority of this room is male, I was going to say, if if you or your spouse has suddenly become pregnant, your dietary needs are going to uh, change uh, drastically compared to... Let's go for Christmas. Who eats yeah. differently at Christmas time <laughs> than they would today? Like, that's pretty much a given. Like, so what you do on Christmas is going to be different than what you do other days of the year. Yeah. Um, so then it gets to... How do you know what metrics are actually correct? You want to measure something if you're, you're, you're trying to apply a systematic approach to uh, what you're, you're eating. Um, uh, the, the major problem here is that most people aren't actually subject matter experts in uh, food and nutrition. Well, which is everybody why thinks they're an expert in food. I mean, we all eat, so why aren't we experts? Yep. Um, and, and as I say, engineers are people who have uh, great uh, subject matter expertise in one particular domain, enough general expertise to be really dangerous to themselves and others. Um, so uh, as a result, you know, you, you have to, you know, this is the same thing when you're, you're developing an app or whatever, you wanna um, talk to whoever you're, you wanna understand the problem domain and the way that you do that is you have to rely on uh, subject matter experts. Um, and 
uh, one of the, the problems is that because everybody eats, they think that they have in intuitions about uh, how it is that they feel and how food <laughs> makes them feel. But and there's just a lot of common like knowledge that people think they have that is just not true. Like eight glasses of water a day, anybody? Uh, that came from a beauty magazine in the 1920s. There is no scientific background to that, but everybody seems to know that one. Yeah. And here I am consuming water, which is a good thing, but where does it come from? Like, what, where does like, the knowledge base come from? Right. Um, so then the question is, what sources, if you can't necessarily trust your intuitions, what sources can you trust? And this is a problem that you see both in software and in uh, nutrition. So like, would you trust certification from this guy? Um, this is Zed Shaw, for people who may not know, um, who uh, back at the heyday of Mongrel was um, asked by a couple people whether uh, he would offer them Mongrel certification. Um, I don't know whether you can read this, but uh, Joe Ruby here, as a result, has listed himself as mud crap certified. Um, Go mud crap. <laughs> uh, and uh, Zed was going around at the time as a master black belt sifu in uh, mud crap certification. Um, so, uh, you know, and y y you may or may not take uh, certification from Zed. Zed, uh, regardless of what el else you want to say about him, is actually a very good and solid programmer. But I'm pretty sure if the certification is called mud crap, <laughs> it might indicate something. Yes. Um, so, uh, what about this guy, right? So, this is from the American Association of Nutritional Consultants. Uh, Has a nice official seal. Yes, uh, Mr. Eddie Dykeman, um, and with all of the honors, rights, and privileges he uh, here to pertaining. Um, and uh, if you actually meet Eddie Dykeman, you will notice one particular characteristic about him, which is that he's got uh, an awesome tie, um, and that he's a dog. Uh, uh, it's actually Sir Eddie, just point of note. Yes, um, his, his, his proper his title is proper. <laughs> his proper title is Sir Edward of Dundee. Um, and uh, he, uh, Eddie's owner is actually a dietitian, um, and uh, you know she she did this to prove the point that you know even a dog could actually get certified by a lot. With of sixty dollars, by the way, yeah. any of you guys want to become a nutritionist? Sixty dollars. And and so there there is a, uh, we need to understand that when somebody calls themselves say a nutritionist that. Uh, it's completely unregulated. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. I'm going to say I could say I'm a Ruby programmer. I don't know much about Ruby. I only know from what I hear from him. But I could say I'm, I'm one. Yeah, and likewise, I, I can declare myself a nutritionist just from having married a dietitian or something. Um, actually, there, there's a- You're probably more qualified than a dog. Probably. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so, <laughs> most people don't have a, a lot of time to do background research or the uh, knowledge or wherewithal to actually go out and explore a lot of this. And even if you do, it's hard to get um, a good bearing on what information is credible and what information isn't credible. Because so that certificate looked fairly official, right. the name of the organization sounds official, and Sir Eddie has the certificate. Yeah, and um, so you'll, you'll get other cases where the po popular press will, because they don't understand this any better than anyone else does, will uh, try and pick up on a press release that um, a, uh, an actual scientific source has published. So there's like the Robarts Institute of Science, which just this past week, um, or maybe two weeks ago, published a release saying that egg yolks are worse for you than the double down KFC sandwich. Yeah. which I don't know how many of you guys know about it, but it's an awesome sandwich that has two chunks of KFC meat and maybe some uh, tomato. Cheese and bacon. Cheese and bacon? Yes, okay. cheese and bacon. So it's cheese, bacon, and two chicken patties. Nothing else. No bun, no nothing. Which is technically worse for you if you have serious heart disease and you need to watch your... And you're looking only for the metric of cholesterol, cholesterol. content. Um, so the, the popular press picked up on this and trumpeted the fact that eggs were worse for you than the KFC double down sandwich. Um, which, which, yeah, so, you know. And then we can go for that um, recent release by that uh, nutrition, or the um, professor of nutrition, I can't remember at which university, uh, but the junk food diet where he lost like 20 some odd pounds only eating stuff from a vending machine. Okay, yeah, he lost that weight. Uh, he also, the whole stunt was to prove that if you decrease your caloric intake, you will lose weight, period. It doesn't matter what you eat. But was it healthy? 
I'm pretty sure it wasn't. <laughs> and if you looked at the other metrics, such as blood pressure and LDL levels and HDL, which is all your cholesterol levels, they would have decreased somewhat just because he lost weight. Um, but that doesn't really mean a whole lot. It was definitely not healthy. And yeah. he was saying it was not healthy, but a lot of the news sources reported, hey, you can eat from a vending machine, chips and chocolate bars all you want and lose weight, woo. Yeah, and so I mean, like the, the important part about this is understanding the context that some of this stuff happens. And I mean, it, this is this is the same way that we function. It, you know, it's duct typing. You want to look at what exactly does this thing do? Um, how does it do it? Um, where is it going to be useful? I mean, this so these are the quack, fundamentals. Quack yes, you look like a duck, quack <laughs> like a duck, all that sort of stuff. Um, this is does it float? fundamentally science um, and science applied to your life. Um, so. The question is, you know, given the fact that there's so much confusion and chaos in this sphere, what can you actually do? Um, how can we actually make ourselves healthier? Um, and, you know, of course, the, it's important then to uh, find uh, trustworthy information sources, which and are out there. You just need to find people who have actually spent some time in the domain. And basically know what is trustworthy, which to do that is pretty difficult in many ways, but some steps can be taken. So for instance, you want to make sure that you're not cargo culting. Um, and, you know, in essence, there, there are a lot of people who pick diets up um, that have been recommended to them from somewhere else. And the rich and famous? Yeah. You know, um, what do they know? The, the, the problem here is that, again, you, you've got a, a stack of uh, fields and components that you've got to go through. And uh, people may focus on one and not the other and not necessarily understand why, what sort of harm can come to them if they're uh, picking a particular diet and not understanding uh, what the mechanism is by which they function. So for instance, the, the Atkins diet is a really good example of this. Um, which I'm pretty sure everybody is aware of what the Atkins diet is. Uh, you're basically trying to remove all carbohydrates from your diet, which uh, is going to be bad. Um, because basically your brain needs carbohydrates to function. Although you can function without carbohydrates, you're ending up uh, lowering the pH in your blood, which, you know, acidic blood, not a good idea, yeah. um, which I can go into later on. Um, the other one is, say, a uh, zone diet. Uh, if you know who wrote the zone diet, he is a doctor. He has a PhD in biochem, actually. Uh, he got fired from the university he was working at. Uh, all of his research grant money was taken away. And then about 10 years later, he developed his own diet. So, I mean, so do we want to listen to him? I'm not so sure. Uh, if you look at his publication record, not so great, which is one metric. Another metric is uh, like what the contents of the diet is. And yes, it will work, but I'm not so sure it's a great idea. So I mean, the, the important part about looking at, at things, and part of you know not cargo culting, is being able to pick appropriate healthy measures. So you know, uh, y you can optimize towards whatever you want, but the question is, w what are you optimizing towards and why? So for instance, boxers are gonna um, get up uh, prior to weigh in and try and get below into a lower weight class or whatever. And the way that they do that is basically they starve themselves and don't drink any fluids. And that does have the effect of uh, making you lighter. Because it depletes your glycogen storage, which is basically the storage that your body has for overnight. So basically you go into starvation mode, which yeah, when you deplete your glycogen storage, which takes about 16 hours of not eating anything, uh, you'll lose two to five pounds right away. Which how many diets will tell you like, hey, within the first couple of days, you're gonna lose two to five pounds. Gasp, yeah. surprising. Yeah, and then everybody's surprised why they put it back on once they start eating food or whatever, because you were basically fasting. Um, and you know, y you can see all sorts of you know uh, hilarious process errors um, that y are um, also seen in uh, the programming world um, when when people don't do this. So um, a friend of mine decided that he would follow the waterfall model and uh, uh, basically said that all right, well, eating carrots is healthy. I'm going to eat a bag of carrots every day which he, he uh, took, um, having planned out, and implemented fantastically. He, he spent every day eating carrots for about three or four months. And about a pound of carrots a day. Yeah, and so um, when which, we... you know, we, everybody hears carrots are good for you. Right. Uh, he turned orange. <laughs> yeah. Uh, he even was able to turn parts of his hair color, um, which is very surprising, because that means he had 
really overdone on the beta carotene, which is really fabulous in some sense because it has to take a lot of determination to do that. He was really set on what he was doing. Yeah. Um, but since a lot of what's in carrot is water soluble, that means he was consuming more carrots than he was able to get basically pee out. Yeah. So, so that was that a good way of doing it? Yeah. I don't know, do you want to be orange? I mean, a lot of women pay lots of money to become orange, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and our, our illustrious speaker of the house as well. Um, so, I mean, you know, it's, it's important to be able to pick the, the, the proper metrics, and part of being able to do that is um, knowing what your inputs are and actually learning what is FUD, what is marketing, what's just misleading. Like, you know, if, if uh, you're looking at nutritional information for the things that you eat, like being able to watch your beta carotene or, you know, uh, how, how many people here think that vitamin water is actually healthy? Actually, this is probably the wrong crowd to answer, all right. But, you know, vi vitamin water is being sued currently, or Coke, um, who, who owns Coke vitamin. Coke owns it. Um, yeah. And vitamin water actually is, in many metrics, worse for you than pop. So you think you're getting your vitamins, but, okay, you are, but. Yeah, they're, they're having There's to so much sugar in it to make it Not taste zero. of zero. Um, I'm not. There's a zero calorie version. There's a zero calorie version. Um, the other question, though, is about uh, how bioavailable the vitamins are for you. Because um, even like with pills and supplements and so on, you can only get so much out of it at any point in time. Basically, your body gets overloaded in your intestinal tract and cannot absorb as much as possible. Like, so no matter how much calcium you take, you can only get so much calcium at one point in time. So a lot of these vitamin waters, yeah, you'll, it says it'll get like 200% of something. You're not gonna get that. Yeah. You just can't absorb it. Your body just cannot do it. Yeah, and so being able to look at things like bioavailability is important. Um, and I've got a video to show you in a, a, a moment. But uh, you know, th there are other claims that people make like um, you know, low fat or low calories, reduced sugar. Like what, what do these actually mean? Like wh what exactly is a low fat Twinkie, right? Um, which they, they do make and stuff. Yes, they do. Um, I saw them not so long ago. <laughs> but I mean, they, they've got uh, other problems, right? Or we could go for like those Hungry Man breakfasts. You can, like if they were to advertise a low fat Hungry Man breakfast, that means it's 25% less fat than what its previous uh, one was. And when you go for Hungry Man breakfast, that would still be like 800 calories in one meal. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, it's low fat. But what does low fat mean? Yeah, I don't know if you've ever looked at a Hungry Man breakfast, but each one is a box about yay large, has two servings, and each serving has, I think, 100 and, or no, 90% of your daily intake of fat um, <laughs> in one meal. Which point of note, most people think like the microwave meals are all one serving. Like, yeah. that's how they advertise them. If you actually look at the nutrition content, frequently one of those containers will actually contain multiple servings. Um, so the nutritional information when you're looking at it doesn't always mean what you think it means either, because yeah, and so it has, might have double, it might have triple. How much is a serving of, I don't know, chips? I think it ends up being like six to 12 in a lot of companies, which how many of us eat six to 12 chips? I know I don't. Um. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, you know, it's, that's not just restricted to uh, microwave dinners or uh, junk food. I mean, you, you've got weird things like, we saw a, a bag of potatoes in a store that was listed as, uh, uh, zero ch cholesterol, which is It's odd. great. It definitely has very, 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 very low cholesterol. Yeah, which and if they true. didn't have low cholesterol, that means they probably had to genetically modify it uh, with some kind of animal. Um, because, hey, cholesterol is basically only made by mammals and all kinds of other uh, creatures Animal. that are moving around, not potatoes. Yeah, so I mean, it's, it's difficult. Y you really need to understand who's selling you what and why and why they're making these claims. And you know, part of that is really important for when you move on to the next step, learning how to cook. I mean, it's really important to not just eat junk food and try and um, uh, eat healthier by picking the things that you're actually eating as opposed to going to restaurants and um, having them make things. I mean, you know, restaurants basically are trying to optimize well, towards- they're trying to make money. Yeah. is what it comes down to. Any of these things, they're trying to make money, um, which makes sense. However, that does mean that they're not really caring about um, <laughs> what would be good for you. And most of them use the excuse, well, we don't expect everybody to like eat only at this restaurant um, every single day. Um, so a lot of them might know that it's not healthy for you to eat it every day, but they will, that doesn't matter. 
Um, yeah, so I mean, they're, they're expecting you not to. Um, yes? Uh, going back earlier, you're on the road a lot, so it's not really an option to six months at a time. So. Oh, completely, and I totally understand. Um, I've been there, done that. Um, I find that for the most part, you kind of just have to ask for different things. Um, which isn't really easy and a lot of people get unhappy. But it goes back to the, what are you optimizing for? If you can't do it, you can't do it. It's not like there's a magic bullet. <laughs> um, but on that note, like for breakfast, for example, this morning we had a choice of the Continental for free or we could have gone for like an extra $5 for the one that had eggs and bacon and everything else. Well, the Continental has fruit, which actually probably is more expensive than the other things, but that's besides the point. Um, so you kind of just have to. And this is a perfect example of them trying to optimize towards, you know, we've got hot food, obviously you're going to want that, so we're not going to give it to you free. Um, but yeah, not necessarily the best, best choice um, uh, if you're trying to eat healthy. And, and you know, part of uh, all of this, um, once you've got your source material and you, you've made stuff, you need to know what it is once you've actually eaten it that it's going to do in your body. And that does require some basic biology knowledge. Um, but unfortunately, basic biology knowledge tends to look like this. It's <laughs> very easy, trust me. Um, you know, this is a very simplified overview of energy metabolism. Uh, there's a lot of magic in this particular diagram. Um, but I mean, if anybody, I know probably most people don't want to think about high school, and it could have been many years ago. Uh, for me, it was called the Krebs cycle. I think for younger people, it's a citric acid cycle. I'm not sure what the term they use. The little circle on the bottom, that's what it is, right there. But w at least like in high school, they don't really explain what this means at all. Um, so if you look at this chart, basically the proteins, glucose, and fatty acids eventually all basically go the same way. Like they go to the same place, your body uses them all. So you can technically basically eat only proteins. However, since your brain needs glucose, your body has to then go from the proteins, the amino acids to the pyruvate up to the glucose eventually. So that's like what would happen in the Atkins diet. Yeah, but however, since that is, um, takes more energy to do basically, the proteins will frequently go to the amino acids, acetyl-CoA, and then go over to the ketone bodies. Ketoacidosis, so um, if anybody has diabetic friends, relatives, or is diabetic themselves, ketoacidosis might ring a bell. Um, basically, you're making your, pee, your blood a lot more acidic, um, and that can cause major problems. And any of these things can all go down to fatty acids, so fat, your store, like what your body's storing it as. Um, and all of these things, they are essential in some extent. There are essential amino acids that you have to have. If you don't have them, you will lose weight, but that's because your body can't function properly. There's right. also essential fatty acids, which are the like fish oil that everybody's talking about and the flax seeds and so on. Um, and without that, you're screwed. And Twinkies don't have any of these things. Right. And, and so like the funny thing about the Twinkies is, all right, so low fat Twinkies, they've removed a bunch of fat, so you're not getting as many fatty acids, but they've just added in a whole bunch more calories of glucose. A lot of the things that are low fat are frequently actually have more calories than the fatty option. Yeah. So, um, and they, because they want to make it taste better. They want to, you to buy it, and if it doesn't taste good, you're not going to buy it. Um, so they will increase salt, they'll increase sugars, they will increase all kinds of things. So. Be careful about what people claim and what labels claim, because they are going to work around them no matter what. Um, and like for vitamins and minerals, um, bioavailability is very important um, to use cereal, iron fortified cereal. Everybody sees that. However, what does iron fortified cereal mean? Um, actually, technically, they basically take shavings of iron and throw it into your cereal, uh, which is great. Uh, do you want to? Do we have a so I will show you this video really quickly here. Um, oh dear, where did it go? I don't know. All right, no, I'm not going to show you the video right now. Okay. We'll show you At the any video rate, after. this <laughs> basically um, one of the food science exercises that we like to do towards kids, just because kids think this is really cool, is that you basically take a bunch of iron fortified cereal, say bran flakes, um, any kind of thing like that, you put it into a blender with some water, you mix it all up. And then you take a magnet and you put the magnet in, and hey, you get a whole bunch of iron shavings. Woo! 
So, I mean, but yeah. how what can you do with those iron shavings in your body? And for the most part, not a whole lot. Uh, so yeah, it's iron fortified, and they might really think that they are helping you out, but not really. So I mean, the, the basic problem here is that, you know, in a, especially in a case like that, we, we've basically got people who are only looking at part of the loop that we're talking about, and nobody's looking at the full stack and going, okay, do we understand what's actually going on biochemically, or uh, do we know uh, what else people are eating this with, how far has this come, that sort of stuff. So we really do need to like, you know, apply what we've learned in software and go, all right, um, uh, what do we need to accomplish? How are we gonna achieve that? Um, once we've done it, how can you actually uh, test that and um, finally settle on some sort of cycle that actually does uh, meet the requirements that you need? And that can include all sorts of stuff, whether you know, it fits in with your travel schedule, whether it fits in with um, the things that you have available to you uh, uh, in, uh, in uh, the grocery store and all that sort of thing, which is one of the Or if you reasons. don't live near a grocery store, yeah. I mean, people will shop anywhere that has food, so. Yeah. So, um, that's what, uh, and you know, at, at this point, uh, these are all, all of our slides, but you know, it, we've got somebody here who actually knows um, a lot about uh, the food chain, so I wanna make sure that everybody gets time to ask uh, questions. So thank you very much. And uh, I guess feel free to email me or uh, That's awesome Twitter. Um, I'm crupar at gmail.com. I'm obviously very uh, creative towards that. Yeah. <laughs> um, or I guess at uwo.ca if you want to go for a more official route. Yeah. But questions? Um, as you know, your husband probably leads a somewhat sedentary work life <laughs> as a programmer. Mm, possibly. You, how do you coach like Ted to get off his butt? Well, no. I <laughs> <laughs> well, in, for our particular case, uh, where we ended up setting up um, base, like our apartment, is actually kitty quarter to the um, grocery store. So we try to walk there, um, walk up and down stairs. It seems like a really basic and stupid idea, but that's pretty good. Um, like I've heard, like having a standing desk. Yeah, that helps um, just because you're strengthening muscle and muscle does use up more, um, like it uses up more. It and just needs, has more needs. Yeah, and, um, your, and, your, and your blood flow as well. I yeah, mean, actually, your blood I, flow. That, that's exactly what I do. I've got, I've basically got a podium that I've got my laptop on and I'm maybe typing on the laptop, I may be sitting, I may be laying down. Um, you can go for more extreme routes. I know that we have a stationary bicycle and we actually have a table that can go over top of it. So you can actually have your computer on there and be using your bicycle. But that's a little bit uh, probably extreme for most people. I know that. I found it very difficult to play Team Fortress 2 while cycling. <laughs> but some of the other games you can play. Yeah. Sorry, can you say that a little louder? Yes, I'm saying that all the science is great that and we have too much crap food, um, <laughs> definitely. And that goes to um, basically the uh, professor who showed that no matter how much you eat, as long as you lower your caloric intake, you will lose weight. Um, so people do just have to kind of cut back. Uh, if you look at all the servings that we have at restaurants here, they're gigantic. Uh, most of them, if you look at like the American Dietetic Association, like like what they call like a serving, and I know the Canadian dietetic is one much better just because I'm Canadian, um, but a lot of them, like a piece of meat is only supposed to be about the size of a deck of cards by their measurements, 
which most of us eat a whole lot more than that. Um, so I think it's probably key to actually just like learn how much people should be eating and in the context of what it is. Yeah, and, and the, the other important part is not just portion control, but I mean, again, making sure that the composition of what you eat is the right thing for you to be eating. Again, if you can lose weight by eating Twinkies, that doesn't mean that you're healthy. It might taste good. I mean, I was, like, I am a chef, so I do really do appreciate good food and tasty food. Yeah. Mark. What is your favorite meal that you're really happy with really happy with yourself? Uh, the canola one? Yeah, probably the canola. Yeah. Um, so uh, there's a Japanese dish that uh, uh, my, my wife found that is. Well, my, uh, one of my Japanese friends gave right. it to me. Um, it, it's a chicken. Canoa, which is a South American grain. It's actually really good. It's kind of like crunchy rice. It's, it's delicious. I prefer the red. Um, yeah. It's crunchy rice, basically. Uh, it's actually one of the few grains that has all protein, like uh, all the amino acids that you need. So it's one of the only complete grains out there. Um, it's, it's got a soup base using chicken broth and um, uh, a little bit of soy sauce for saltiness. Um, green onion. And green onion. Uh, and some egg. Um, I can actually, I mean, we can post the recipe if you'd like. <laughs> yeah. Well, what, what what do you prefer? Is it um, that's that's definitely one of my favorites. Okay, I obviously am obsessed with food. I mean, <laughs> I went from being a chef to going into nutrition. So asking me to limit things down to one is not going to be very <coughs> easy. Um, we'll, we'll just post recipes if you. Yeah, don't maybe that would be best. <laughs> I'll just post a whole bunch of things. <laughs> Wait, so you mentioned about the body's ability to uh, actually uh, extract from vitamins and minerals and supplements and stuff like that. Uh, so the question is really, how do you determine what your intake should be when you spread it out over the day? Does that mean by taking more out throughout the day, to spread it the time well, lapse? I, I'm a big advocate of um, trying to get what you need from natural sources. So carrots and your broccoli and so on. Granted, I do take actually B12 because I know that I don't get enough of it. Um, basically, you have to spread it out. There are a whole bunch of really little things that you could do, but it's probably more of a pain in the ass than anything else. <laughs> um, so things like you can increase your iron intake if you uh, actually increase your vitamin C intake at the same time. So if you consume juice with meat, you'll actually be getting more iron because um, they're coenzymes. Uh, but on a whole, spread it out. Um, humans really aren't supposed to just like eat one big food, like one big meal. Uh, it's better to definitely just be. So snacking is good, just not on junk food. Yeah. I mean, I snack all the time. What did you say? The sound of boredom is carrots? Yes. Yeah, that's, that's how she keeps awake when studying. I like them. So. But I don't turn orange. Yes. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yes? If you're going to post recipes, I'd be interested in especially seeing things that are quick. Yeah, oh, definitely. Oh, as, as a full-time, like, I'm working, I'm doing classes, I have everything. My time schedule is very limited. Uh, and a lot of the things I do is actually I end up freezing, so then I can just pull it out and heat it up. So I'll definitely post things that are very, yeah. pull out of the freezer, throw in something. <laughs> that was one of the first purchases we made as a married couple. We got a chest freezer. Um, which we actually got from like Kijiji for a few dollars. Like it wasn't really expensive. So, just put it somewhere. Oh yeah, um, the best way to store things in a freezer, um, like for meat, so it doesn't get freezer burn, is to uh, basically you wrap it up in plastic and then you wrap it in tin foil and that decreases um, the moisture coming in and out. And freezer burn, just point a note, it's not going to hurt you. It's dehydration. It's freezer burn, like it's removing all, I mean like freeze dried food, that is all freezer burnt food. So it won't taste as good, but there's nothing wrong with it. So if I have a piece of meat that I forgot about, I'll put it into a stew or something like that because you know, it's going to cover up the taste, and I just spilled water on you. <laughs> <laughs> right. Anyone else? 
post your recipes to, to GitHub so we can fork them and refactor. Okay, that, that sounds a great good. idea. <laughs> sounds good. All right. Yeah. All right. Okay. Well, thank you, everybody.